Okay, we have around uh, 20 people, so perhaps we can start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So today we have a signature uh, lecture from Prof Professor Mari Lundström from Aalto University in Finland. Professor uh, Lundström is strongly focused on sustainable metals production, circularity and criticality of materials. She holds a chair of hydrometallurgy and corrosion in Aalto University and is one of Europe's leading researchers on recycling of batteries. Since 2015 in the Acad Academy, she has built a successful research group of approximately 25 members, published 180 scientific papers and supervised 14 PhDs to completion. She works closely uh, in the interface between academy and industry, and she is the head of National Battery Me Metals Ecosystem, the so-called Bat Circle 2.0, which is a Finland-based battery metals ecosystem consisting of 15 companies and six research institutes. And she's PI of several European Union projects. She also acts as uh, vice dean for research and innovation at the School of Chemical Engineering. So without further ado, we can start the presentation entitled Minerals, Batteries and Energy Transition. Greetings from Finland. Mari, the floor is yours. We have about 45 minutes presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much of the kind kind in, instruct, introduction. And I will I will share my screen so we will start. Let's see. So is the is the screen? Uh, yes, it looks good. It looks good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for for uh, inviting me to to join your uh, lecture series. As mentioned, so um, let's see how we get this. So um, I come a bit from the other side of the world. Uh, here it's morning. It is now summer, summer and, and, and about 23 degrees. Uh, we are in Scandinavia. Uh, our neighbor is Russia and, and Sweden. And a small country, about 5.5 million inhabitants in Finland. And uh, I would like to discuss a bit of, or, or tell a bit of greetings from Finland, from the history but also from the future that we see with the energy transitions and, and, and minerals. And of course, um, minerals are also very much in our focus. We see the importance of them. And, and we see also that people who know this field and also research innovations in this field are critical to make the green transition true. Uh, the content of today's lecture will start actually now with a bit of numbers of energy transition, which is probably very familiar to you. We will look at the metals, the background for why do we need minerals? And actually, because of the time limitations, we will skip now the global resources and, and the, the geographical locations of the raw materials, but more focus on the on the needs. And then we go take a short glimpse to the history of Finland that how this kind of a small country of 5 million people actually can have quite a big role in the global mineral uh, competence chain. And, and then I will uh, share a couple of greetings from the Bat Circle 2.0 from this national battery metals ecosystem and of the work we have done and also of the European strategic work we have done with the batteries. Uh, but as appetizer, so uh, probably you didn't know that actually Finland is ranked as number four in the in the competitive uh, value chain ranking of lithium batteries. If we think of the all the countries, so Bloomberg has ranked after China, Canada and US, Finland as number four. If we compare to, for example, Australia, Australia is ranked as number 10. So it's quite a, a unique position for such a small country that how come uh, external evaluators think that, that Finland is so competitive in this transition. Also, if we look from these evaluated uh, topics only, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, 
not focusing so much on raw materials, battery manufacturing, ESG or, or down, downstream demand. So we are globally number one in this ranking. And we are number one in of the European countries. So hopefully some of the uh, greetings I will share. So we'll give you idea that why Finland has a bigger role in this uh, global uh, game at the moment as, as compared to its geographical size. But uh, we will first start with this energy transition and, and need of minerals. I think this is something that you all work every day with. So uh, you're very familiar with the mineral intensivity of the future. If we think that 2021, we used about over 4 billion metric tons of oil. And that is something that we aim along the green transition to, to decrease. So it means that we need a lot of renewable energy, energy storage and, and new applications that like, use this clean energy. But when we take a look on whether it's nuclear power, solar panels, uh, wind energy, those all are much more mineral intensive from the raw material point of view when compared to natural gas and even compared to the coal. So these numbers, for example, are uh, solar panels are uh, about 3.5 times more intensive than coal, what they need in mineral raw materials to make the same facility for energy production. Even the nuclear uh, energy is mineral intensive. And if we take a look on the electrification, at least in Europe, the, the electrification of cars has proceeded very fast. So uh, each of these cars, to, to manufacture these cars will need six times more minerals when compared to the uh, traditional combustion engine cars. So for the general audience, it's a bit surprised that these aspects of the green transition, clean energies and smart and sustainable transport from the renewable energy production to the actual energy storage and energy use, that these all steps actually move the society from the oil-based society towards mineral-based society. And it is, of course, then very clear that this kind of center of excellence, as, as you are involved with, or the work that we are doing in Finland, and even planning to strengthen this, this uh, mineral innovation work uh, more, so it is critical to make this even possible. There is no green transition without minerals and without true innovations in the use of minerals. If we take a look even not only to the electric vehicles or batteries, but even to hydrogen economy, which is very much discussed nowadays, and at least in, in Finland, we just uh, published a hydrogen uh, uh, program launch, like in national level. So even that those can't happen without uh, a lot of minerals. In this case, for example, hydrogen production needs a lot of catalyzing uh, surfaces for its production. So what other minerals or metals that we need? Um, in coal, we have traditionally needed copper, some of the nickel, uh, chrome and others. And copper is quite a dominating metal needed in all of the renewable uh, energy applications, as well as traditional coal and natural gas applications. But uh, both the copper amount, but in addition, the other metals like nickel, manganese, uh, molybdenum, chromium are needed in wind energy, in, uh, with, in solar energy, then a bit different materials like silicon is very much dominating uh, in nuclear. So not only the amount of metal, but also the variety of metals increases. And of course, then we have some of these metals, like rare earth metals, uh, which become more dominant in the, in the uh, uh, motors, like electric vehicle motors, or then in the offshore, onshore wind energy that we need in the permanent magnets, which uh, bring a new, new uh, part to the equation which is not uh, 
so well recycled nowadays and not so widely produced globally in different countries. So we have a lot of geographical differences in this production and, and refining. So this, this figure of the International Energy Agency shown here, it shows quite clearly the trend towards high mineral intensivity, but also towards more complex complex uh, use of these minerals and, and metals refined from those ones. And even bioenergy, geothermal energy, those energy formats that uh, were not list listed by International Energy Agency, even those are highly dependent on some of the metals. For example, geothermal energy is dependent on nickel and chromium. Bioenergy uses a lot of copper. And, and here it's maybe could you take a look on the hydrogen that is, is uh, now discussed a lot that uh, not only nickel, uh, rare earths, but, but also precious metals, platinum group metals are higher involved with the hydrogen production. In hydrogen production, um, of course, we have the traditional methods for making hydrogen, but it has been discussed widely that the future would be in the water splitting. Water splitting, anode and cathode reaction and the difference needs a lot of energy, first of all, just to produce the hydrogen. And because of this high energy intensivity, which would need, need in order to be sustainable, a lot of clean energy, like, like renewable energy, which is also metal intensive. So, so even this water splitting, it needs uh, uh, to minimize the energy consumption. And then because of high electrode potential between anode and cathode reactions, we can't allow high over potentials for oxygen or hydrogen evolution. And then these catalyzing metals like PGMs, but also more abundant catalyzing metals, maybe based on nickel or, or other metals. So become uh, to have a bigger role. So while we might decrease a bit of need in, in, in the catalyzing metals in the, in the combustion engine vessels, we will have a lot of applications that need more of the catalyzing metals. Um, electric vessel is, of course, a very traditional uh, example. Uh, not only batteries, but, but even in terms of copper, if we compare here, again, the values from the International Energy Agency, so values of copper that are needed for, for uh, electric vessel, they are double the amount needed for the comb combustion engine car. And on top of that copper wiring, we have all the battery metals there. And alone, alone in, in Europe, the needed amount of electric vessels or planned predicted amount of electric vessels are up to 8 million by 2030. So that would mean 10 to 20 gigafactories only to make the batteries, only batteries for, for the electric vessels. So far, we don't have locally those, those uh, gigafactories yet in, in Europe, and, and we are dependent uh, also on many battery metals. If we take a look on copper alone, so uh, it has been calculated that so far mankind has mined 700 million tons of copper. And it has been also evaluated that 80% of that is still in use. And while, while we look at the predictions that how much more copper we will need, so the equation or the question that do we really need mining? Uh, can we fulfill this demand by, by recycling? It is quite an easy equation that if most of this copper is in use and at the same time the use is increasing, so recycling cannot supply any remarkable part of the growing need of the co copper. Uh, it has been also predicted that we would need to produce the same amount of copper during the next 22 years, what we have done during the past history of the mankind. So this over 700 million um, metric tons of the copper would be needed in next 22 years. And, and 
by the increase in use, by the quite good durability of the copper, co copper in, in use. So even copper is such a metal that we, of course, we want to recycle, we can well recycle, but we need to mine more. This prediction is from the uh, Geological Survey of US. But if we compare to the International Energy Agency 2021, so uh, for the green uh, green transition needs, so so they are of the same magnitude. For example, uh, 2030, 24, the International Energy Agency prediction is around 30 million tons annually co uh, copper production of which one to two million goes for low carbon power generation, 10 million for electricity networks, one to three million to EVs and storage, and, and 15 to 20 to other sectors. So, so they are quite much aligned with the geological survey of, of US, these evaluations. Then if we look the, or change our focus to battery metals, so there we found, well, we find nowadays a lot of different materials. But for example, cathode is of course the ma material we talk most about. We talk about cobalt, which has been recently more replaced with nickel rich chemistries in batteries. Manganese is taking a bigger role also there. And, and lithium, of course, in all of these lithium batteries in most of the electric vessels plays a role. Uh, LFP batteries, uh, lithium iron phosphate has taken more of role and, and uh, they bring in other a challenge for this in, in, in respect of recycling. But not only these cathode materials, which we quite well can and, and also economically are, are determined to recycle. So we have also anode materials. We have graphite there on the anode. And this graphite, for example, despite of being, for example, EU critical raw material coming from the mostly from the natural resources, uh, we don't recycle any at this moment. So there is a lot to do uh, in terms of supply of, of uh, raw materials for, for graphite. Then we have other materials like polymers. We have toxic fluorides, separators, membranes. We have electrolyte salts, solvents, casings, bringing other materials like, like uh, iron and of course aluminum coming from the electrode materials. So it's quite a mixture of materials and metals mostly originating from, from uh, non-fossil resources and mostly something that we people who work with the minerals. So as we know how to refine the primary raw materials, we also know how to develop the recycling processes for this. But what will be the role of recycling? Here we see one of the predictions of the city. Well, it's more of the financial people. So uh, not taking too seriously these, these predictions, but still even by the logical thinking, it seems like also need of lithium, nickel and cobalt here as an example of battery materials, battery uh, metals. So even though these needs are increasing during the next 10 years critically, and even after that for, for nickel and, and lithium, so recycling will not play a big role before 2040. Because now the generation, first generation of batteries are only in the early part of their life. They predicted lifetime is surprisingly long. And while the need is increase, increasing so dramatically, so uh, we actually don't get them back to recycling. So all of these first generation, they dominantly, the raw materials need to come from the minerals. Of the numbers, so uh, all different sources, Bloomberg City and International Energy Agency are quite much in the same line. For example, that lithium would be needed 2030, around two to three million tons a year. Uh, cobalt uh, would not increase so much, but uh, would be over 100 kilotons uh, a year. A bit of differences in predictions depending on the lithium uh, battery development, and that nickel will increase up to from one one to five uh, uh, megatons a year up to four four uh, uh, million tons. So needs 
of all of these uh, materials will increase all the time and how much will depend a lot that, uh, on the actual speed of the development. Um, if we take a look more closely to the international energy, pre uh, energy prediction, so here we see two scenarios. The lower one, so the step scenario, is based on a, a quite a realistic scenario where we calculate the stated policies that has been so far uh, announced by the by the uh, uh, like globally and in this scenario even oil will remain in the same level coal will remain in the about the same level but decrease a bit natural gas will increase slightly and 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 use of renewable energies will increase and with such a scenario even with such a scenario when we compare to 2020 so lithium need would be about you know uh, over 10 times higher than 2020 on, on 2040 almost five to ten times higher would be for graphite cobalt and nickel and and even for manganese and if we look, would look at the more sustainable development scenario that has been calculated uh, so these needs could increase for lithium even up to 40 fold graphite, cobalt, nickel, close to 20 fold, and, and manganese even close to 10 fold. Uh, so it is clear that we are going by any of the predictions towards the very mineral intensive society, and it needs also that much more focus on the minerals. One more prediction, this is maybe more dramatic, what was Simon Mishok's uh, from G GTK Geological Survey of Finland uh, has calculated. By the way, my, uh, he originates originally from Australia, but uh, it has been working here in Finland for, for the several years already. But he has made such a prediction, very interesting report in the, you can find it in the uh, web pages of the Geological Survey of, of uh, Finland. So prediction where actually all uh, fossil energy would be replaced. So basically, all the combustion engines would be replaced by electric vehicles. There would be also hydrogen uh, vehicles for the bigger machines. Uh, there would be coal and gas-fired electrical power generations phased out and substituted by renewable energy. And it's a combination, not going into details, but combination of, of hydrogen-based, biofuel-based, nuclear power-based, uh, and a renewable uh, energy-based scenarios. So basically in such a scenario where gas and coal would be replaced, it would need renewable energy by 3,700,000 uh, uh, terawatt hours. So quite huge amount of energy that would be replaced. And, and it shows, well, here is some of the calculations how many hydropower, nuclear power, wind power, solar power, renewables would be needed, but with such an extreme scenario, so when it will be uh, projected towards the raw materials, so this one generation, replacing of the one generation of fossil energy uh, by, by lithium ion batteries only, so it would mean already that copper uh, or copper reserves would be enough for, for the lithium batteries, but then not for nickel, cobalt, lithium, or graphite. So, um, and, and uh, from this lithium battery point of view, if we look at this prediction that it would be part of the total uh, phase out of fossil fuels. So, of course, these numbers, they are slightly higher than the numbers that I showed, the, like, uh, in this slide, what up like Bloomberg City and International Energy Agency, these are more of the predictions that what is uh, politically stated to happen or realistically expected to happen, while this scenario F of, of uh, Simon Michaux, it's more of idealist case where all would be replaced, whether or not it is realistic. And it, it shows numbers that are 
maybe one decade higher of the demand. But in such a case also, it is clear that nickel, lithium, cobalt, graphite would not be, the global reserves would not be even, uh, or it would be only 10% of what would be needed. Uh, so it is clear whatever will be the future that we will need more mines, that recycling will play an important role, but recycling alone will not be enough. And Europe is highly dependent on many of the critical materials, many of the critical metals that are needed in a green transition. Uh, here we see the most critical, some of the most critical materials, for example, we are totally dependent on, on rare earth metals, graphite. Man we are very much dependent on manganese, lithium, cobalt from the uh, primary sources and, and also dependent on zinc and copper. So there is for sure some, some work to do. And if we look at the map that what has been planned, what should be done, or which kind of uh, gigafactories are planned in Europe, not at all in, all in, in production, but to even make these plans through, so where do we actually get all these minerals and materials for European gigafactories? And not, not to talk about uh, the global transition in all the other countries. And such actions or, or uh, politicians have also noted, made the first actions in Europe to, to notice that, well, actually, the decisions that we have made that, that we might have uh, some short uh, shortage of the raw materials to make this transition. So, so this year, March, Green Deal Industrial Plan was launched with Critical Raw Materials Act, Net Zero Industry Act, and new transition state aid rules for Europe. We have also seen, for example, USA, they have made a last year already Inflation Reduction Act. And if we take a look on the China, so China has been already several years plus 15 years working strategically to, to provide the state sub subsidies and, and, and to support this guarantee the raw material is needed for this. So um, I'm sure that nobody has answer for, for this, but, but at least we need that, uh, that the work is needed. And, and that is why I go next to the history of Finland. So while we know that we are in the transition, which is highly mineral and metal intensive. So why Finland? What is our role? What has been our role? And, and what is the back, 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 background that we, we lean on at this moment? So um, I wonder that uh, how many of you have seen this? equipment and and uh, knows where it origins from. Uh, its history comes from the 78 years backwards. Finland was in, in war with Russia uh, and we could keep our independence after the war, but uh, we did lose a lot and we also needed to pay war reparations. And Part of those war reparations was uh, a lot of co metals to provide to Russia and also a lot of uh, copper. And in those times, Finland placed metallurgists, so professionals in metal production, they made one of the biggest innovations uh, in metals history. Maybe one of the biggest innovations of Finland, flash melting furnace which instead of using external energy, actually used the energy coming from the raw material itself to conduct the smelting. The process didn't need any more the energy externally, but while Finland was in, in big energy crisis also, we had lack of everything. And, and the development allowed to use the energy of the sulfur of the raw material for providing the heat and actually making the, the uh, copper. And these innovations from 47, 48 year 
So it's nowadays the dominant technology over 50%, over half of all the copper globally is made using this technology, using the flash melting. So it has been this inno Finland based innovation has become the dominant copper production technology and, and clean technology is still to be developed in uh, or, or to be fostered all these years uh, around the world. But uh, this was not the beginning of the metallurgy, of course. We had already during the under the king of Sweden time uh, on the 16th century. So there was emphasis on the iron production. First iron mills were founded and actually, for example, Bilnes Iron Works. So it was one of the plants which initiated first primary schools in Finland and improved the working conditions of the people. So along uh, metallurgical production, so also education and uh, taking care of the society and, and the village became to the uh, Finnish culture. Uh, and um, of course, technologies has changed uh, in the early la of the last century. So electric arc furnace uh, arrived to Finland and it's, it's still used currently in, for example, Imatra steel plant. Also, the first iron smelter started in 1950s. They were close to uh, Russian border uh, and, and they were also uh, close to water energy that was provided there. And if we take a look on co copper before the time of the flash melting, already there was uh, several small copper works close to Autokumpu. And, and these metals were transported to Imatra, also close to the border where was the uh, iron mill. So for refining, but because of the, of the uh, war time, so the decision was made that all the copper production copper electro winning, electro refining, and, and, and uh, also the anode slimes needed to be uh, the production transported to the western side of the Finland, to Pori. And also political decision was made during the war time that we can't sell anode slimes abroad. So we need to keep the uh, precious metals in Finland. And that actually uh, created uh, foundations for precious metal refining, technology development, and also uh, uh, some of the technological new production in, in Finland. And since those times, so Pori refinery, currently owned by Bullid, and so it has expanded from uh, 10 kilotons to about 180 kilotons a year, its copper production. And also precious metals production is, is conducted there. Well, then Finland also started to focus on nickel production. So at 1960s, Harjavalta plant was started again owned by the state-owned company uh, that is currently owned by the Norris Nickel. And then a uh, new heat bleaching plant, totally unique process of the heat bleaching uh, in Nordic conditions where we might have minus 30, minus 40 degrees. So uh, operating by the heat or generated again from the raw material. So it started operations about uh, a bit over 10 years ago and, and is currently producing battery grade nickel and cobalt also zinc and, and, and waiting for uranium production. And uh, about 4% of global nickel is refined in Finland. And, and it's claimed that this, this uh, terrafame plant in Sotkamotalavivara that it will produ produce 1 million or, or nickel uh, and cobalt needed for 1 million electric vessels with the lowest carbon footprint in the, in the world. Also stainless steel and steel production was strengthened after the war. So there was a uh, first global continuous cast technology at Rahe, uh, Rautaruki plant. Uh, also some special steel started to dominate in, in, in Imatra. And they started the ferrochrome plant uh, in Kemi, and and also there the novel technology of argon oxygen decarbonization was taken into use 26 in the stainless steel factory, uh, and also uh, AOD was taken uh, to the ferrochrome at 90s. So 
Several of different metallurgical plants, they have quite proactively taken new technologies into use while starting all during the during the operation. And uh, from the cobalt side, so we do have uh, one of the biggest cobalt refineries in Kokkola area. And actually over 10% of global cobalt is refined in Finland. So compared to the size of the country, we are very remarkable in, in cobalt refining, currently owned by Yumicor and, and Yervois, or Australian com company. And uh, also Harjavalta nickel plant and uh, this, this uh, Talivara heat plating plant both produce uh, cobalt as a second product. And then we do have the second largest zinc plant in the Europe. And also there has been, for example, direct leaching technology installed at 90s. So bringing uh, conventional or, or alternative technologies to the conventional roasting leaching. And we do have a gold mine, gold refinery in the Lapland of Finland, so Nordic part of the Finland, as well as, as precious metal refining, of, of course, producing gold silver, platinum, palladium. So our history is quite uh, rich in minerals, quite rich in metals, metallurgical innovations, also uh, a bit of proactive and upgrading minded uh, philosophy in the plants, not selling concentrates, but actually refining even during the war time, focusing on, on getting the value even from the, from the precious metals and developing new processes. So based on this history, it is not maybe a surprise that now when we are in the energy transition, when we are going towards clean energy and we, when we are in the mineral intensive uh, uh, times, so, so that Finland is quite ready to answer this. this uh, and we actually have even a lot of potential. We have some lithium deposits that are being or started now a uh, new lithium operation from this podium and, 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 and we have quite low CO2 footprint in the energy mix, electricity mix, which attracts a lot of uh, industry also in these times. And we have seen a lot of actions in the recent years because of the electrification, new investments, big investments in primary production, in secondary re uh, recycling, for example, Fortum battery plant, in uh, upgrading the, the production of the battery materials. The only thing we are still missing is, is the, the fully missing or almost fully missing is Kika factories. That is something we don't have, but we do have a lot of interest on clean energy, on wind energy, but also on, on the different levels of metals production. And, and that's why maybe some explanation that it is not such a surprise that Finland has been doing this transition quite fine and that we are very competitive. And, and uh, in, in, in the lithium battery chain, for example, of course, we wish that we are very competitive in the whole green transition. And uh, why industry innovation infrastructure, we are leading number one in the whole world. Uh, so skills we need today, they are actually skills of our predecessors, skills of our fathers and mothers that has been done for the other purpose on solving the challenge of energy crisis and material crisis maybe 78 years ago, but these skills are now needed for, for the climate crisis. And if we take a look on the battery value chain alone, so this figure aims to show uh, by the green uh, that, that we are, we see that our strengths are in raw materials, in recycling. We are, have strong activities in chemicals and compounds and, and battery packs modules and applications. But what we are, what we want to strengthen is battery cells and active materials. So these are, uh, highest value added mat uh, materials for the batteries and also the battery cells themselves, which are dominantly produced elsewhere. Okay, uh, so, so it is clear why we uh, are in the facing very min mineral intensive society. 
20 and, and years, uh, it is clear that uh, Finland has history that supports us in this. So I will give you a short look on me, uh, Finland's battery. Now we narrow to the batteries, not talking about hydrogen or wind energy, but batteries where we have been working lately very much and uh, a bit also about this battery metals ecosystem bat circle 2.0 that that is actually uh, the uh, ecosystem industrial academic ecosystem working together to keep finland competitive in this uh, finland was one of the countries that made first national battery strategy 21 it was published at the time of covid and and there the objectives were that uh, Finland wants that battery and electrification, this cluster, that it is further go and, and also go through renewal, that we started well, but also that we need to speed up. world will change so fast that we need to be flexible and, and all the time very active in the field and that we need more investment. So we need to, the whole Finland, we need, need to uh, put effort on getting new investments in Finland in this field. And this will need both internal, national co cooperation, but we need to be very competitive also in international cooperation because of nobody can play alone. And, and we are a small country. Uh, we also want that Finland is known as a successful brand, like a Nordic miracle, which we Ha, we, which we are in compared to our size, but also in the batteries, in the electrification, that Finland is known as a successful brand also in sustainable uh, player in the field, and also as a responsible player. So we want to do this with the competitive edge to, to all parts of the sustainability, social, economical, uh, environmental, and uh, that we will play also Finland will play in all parts of the value chain, not only in raw materials or, or recycling, but in all parts of the value chain. And uh, we also see that di digital solutions will expand. And that is also the part where we can take a role. The focus of, of national uh, batteries were at that time 21, uh, checked that they are in the production of battery minerals, advanced battery materials, battery and production technologies, electrification of heavy duty vessels. We have several companies, for example, mining, uh, mining uh, vessel companies that, that are uh, working heavily on electrification of mining vessels, uh, electrified transport solutions and recycling technologies and solutions, all of these made by sustainable and responsible business. So that was the idea that we identify the key areas that also very much focus on the sustainability. And we also recognize in Finland that education, training and research is crucial here. And already since 2019, we have been working together to strengthen this, this uh, competitiveness of Finland, also via research in the interface of academia and, and industry. And here, as, as mentioned uh, in the kind intro, introduction uh, earlier, so we have an ecosystem with, with about uh, 15 industrial players, six research institutes, and a lot of also international stakeholders, advisory board members that all have common aim, either in open research or confidential company research projects. Goal of developing innovations in the battery value chain, improving the manufacturing processes in mining industry, metals and battery chemical industries, increasing the recycling of lithium batteries, improving it and, and strengthening the collaboration between companies and research organizations, playing together, working together and working in, in a sustainable manner and also advisory board that strengths our collaboration and contacts internationally so that we can actually work and make innovations from the whole value chain, from the battery minerals exploration to the recycling and the primary production to the state of art battery materials and then also the circularity as, as a whole. Uh, from uh, 
my university from the Aalto University, which is in the capital area of, of Finland, earlier known as also as, as Helsinki University of Technology. So we have a group of professors who work very strongly in batteries, uh, from mineral processing uh, to hydrometallurgy, pyrometallurgy, thermodynamics, and also to battery development. And, and this group has actually a big role we are leading the, the national battery metal ecosystem, but we have also over 10 million research portfolio in our school for different battery projects in a lot in EU project, but also some of the national uh, uh, ecosystems. So we would uh, say that we, we are very active and also uh, leaders in our field in, in Europe. Some of the examples, for example, what we do, just as a taste, so uh, we do study environmental impacts of different processes, metallurgical processes, such as, as lithium production from spodium and looking at the holistic environmental impact compared to the impact of the primary production, but then also looking in details that what is actually different unit processes and their impact and what could we do to improve and to make this process more sustainable. Here the example is from the spodium and um, alkaline processing. And, and what we see in the figure is that mostly so, soda as quick lime as steam are the ones that bring the highest environmental footprint in this, in this process. So we can then focus on, on experimental work on improving on, of, of those. We have studied different kinds of recycling processes for example, combined leasing of lithium batteries and using nickel metal hydride batteries as, as reductants to reduce the, the uh, need of reduction chemicals and then to decrease also the carbon footprint. And as a small detail, we have also studied the possibility for graphite dis recycling uh, valorization in these publications as a catalyst in zinc air batteries so that the graphite would not be lost but could actually get second life. Uh, as the time is finishing, so I don't go more into details to the uh, batteries Europe and, and the roadmap there, but please, um, if you have time, so take a look. We have published both 2020 and 2021 the roadmap for, for batteries Europe for raw material and recycling. So uh, uh, as, as Finland, we have been leading, I was the chairman in this committee, so we have been leading the strategy work for, for, Finland, uh, for, for Europe that what should be investigated in research for the semi-long term at this moment for primary raw materials and, and recycling to be able to be competitive as a, as a Europe. And, and this work has already resulted in several EU calls and several projects that have, have started. But these uh, documents can be found in the in the commission pages and and there is first one is 70 pages and second one is, is 20 pages so summarizing some of the needs that europe has at the moment uh, but to conclude the presentation so in future of course we are not only looking at batteries we are looking at the minerals as a whole for green transition we think that minerals cannot be any more considered as valuable or non-valuable. We believe that in future all minerals will be critical. So we need to find value also from those ones which are not classically uh, categorized as, as critical raw materials. And also we need to learn to use these minerals in the high value uh, products like energy storage. So alone the performance of the product, for example, battery cannot determine alone the, the in future how the, the energy storage equipment are done, but they need to take into account the global resources, their limitations, and also apply more common materials. We believe that there is no easy way out and, and that we need the system change, that system uh, thinking, and, and that the resources need to be used wisely and holistically looking at the whole picture, whole global picture. And we truly believe that we need a lot of innovations and bright minds. So we need to make a change also with the next generations as how they see our field and its importance of how is the impact our field. And we need to attract the most uh, talented or most eager students to work with us to really 
to even make possible that green transition could happen. We believe that science-based information and, and decisions are critically needed uh, to make this wise, wise change. So, so with these words, I would like to uh, thank you for the possibility to visit you. Said greetings from Finland, and if if you have any questions, so please, there is still some time to to uh, take questions. Thank you, Mari, for this insightful presentation. And uh, are there any questions from the audience? Um, thank you, Mary, for the for the excellent uh, talk and for the overview of the uh, like uh, the energy in 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 Europe as well as in Finland. Uh, you mentioned a few times of the uh, recycling of the batteries or recycling of this. Um, is like a um, can you comment on like what's the stage of this like in terms of the technology development? Are they able to um like the technology already ready to be scaled up for the recycling work or there there are a, a lot of work still need to be done uh in the next 10 years because you mentioned it's only pro probably from 2020 uh 2040 right they make a significant difference uh in in the in the recycling aspect yeah thanks Ex excellent question so uh uh, first, I answer to the latter question. So I believe for sure there is a lot of work to do for the next 10 or 20 years. If we think of traditional copper electro refining, we have worked for 100 years with that and still it needs even a lot of development. So I truly believe that recycling will need uh, a lot of research in the next 10 and, and 20 years exactly. But what we see in Europe that a lot of things have changed in industry. And it is because of this, this new battery uh, regulation that will require recycling also for lithium and over 95% for cobalt, nickel and copper. So here we have seen the biggest change now exactly in the, in the development of lithium recovery in industrial scale. Of course, in academic field, uh, much more uh, research on manganese recovery, on graphite recovery, even on, on other minor element recoveries. But in industry, I think even during the last one year, uh, industry has taken leaps and come out with technologies for, for lithium recovery. For example, not anymore aiming for uh, direct smelting, like Umicore technology smelting of, of all the uh, recycled material, but first fuming out lithium and then going towards more traditional processing. A lot of roasting processes also have been developed to make first selective water leaching for lithium possible as sulfate, sulfation roasting or as, as nitration roasting, but then going towards more traditional methods. So I, I think it has happened a lot and, and the EU regulation has affected now specifically on improvements in technologies for lithium recovery. Uh, but then we do still have, for example, channels for LFP batteries, iron phosphate batteries, where not iron and not phosphate are traditionally recovered and the regulation is not so strongly, for example, demanding anything from the phosphate. So I, I believe that although we see big changes, uh, we need even more research and industrial development to, to recover uh these critical elements like phosphate like graphite uh, and the traditional elements of of nickel in in a better way to to make make the the recycling as a whole more sustainable yeah thank you very much more questions yeah just a question from myself so kevin barber from my company jord who interestingly enough we supplied the um nickel sulfate crystallization plant to Terra Farme and, and also their cobalt sulfate crystallization plants and, and ammonium sulfate. Um, and likewise for Calibre on their lithium compounds for their new refinery as well. Um, just interested what work that you might be doing or associated with in that crystallization space for you know, the ultra pure type compounds as companies keep driving forward to uh, make these components more and more pure 
the challenge continues to get greater and greater in these plants. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. So um, in our university, we do have a one professorship in, in crystallization. Uh, more commonly, when we talk about ultra pure crystallization, so that is not something that uh, uh, companies work with academy. It's maybe more like a, in a way internal work. What we work with these companies are then, for example, mixed uh, and, and now I don't talk about any specific company with names, but as a theme. So, for example, interest what mixed crystallization. So not ultra pure crystallization, but actually if we would make uh, mixed crystals and shorten up the need of extreme separation. And, and then after that, when the ultra pure crystals are combined. So that is something, for example, in the in the conference uh, that was discussed with several of the companies uh, two weeks ago in European metallurgical companies, that how could that um, that be done? It's not something industry is ready for, but the R&D sections are interested to follow up. Also, uh, different co-precipitation of, of uh, recycling elements during the crystallization that how do impurities actually report to and the impurities affect that if we actually allow uh, higher impurities in the crystal. So how do they affect on, on the actual performance of the uh, precursors then produced from these ones? So I would say that the topics with, with Academy that, that these companies, typically primary and recycling companies work with, they look maybe towards like five, five years or 10 years Hmm. front from the current uh, way of operation. Yeah, no, it's some exciting work. You know, from our side, we'd be keen to uh, find a way to get part of Bat Circle 2.0 if it's uh, practical and and uh, try to become more involved in collaborating in those sorts of space. It's um, very, very interesting to us. So, yeah, no, really enjoyed your conversation. And any thank, thank you. Would it be possible for you to put, you see my email, here in this slide so put uh email so i can contact you with our project manager who can then inform maybe about that so go 3.0 which yeah. will start after about one year okay no it sounds good i definitely will and any tips you can give australia for moving from what were we number one or two on the supply chain uh, ranking but uh, low down the um, value add ranking would be much appreciated. Finland certainly has cemented their place in innovation in this space, which is great. Kudos. So thank Kudos. You. Thank you. Hey, is there any uh, quick question for the end? If not, let's thank Mari again for her presentation. And again, if you have questions, uh, I believe they can reach you out in your email. Mari. Yeah, yeah, you can see in this email my oh, in this slide my email. So so please feel feel free and I try to help or then guide for the right contact points if if possible. Great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.